now's the time to talk you through the, the Brexit barometer and the results of it. But I guess what I wanted to do, first of all, was to walk you through maybe some of the big trends that are at play in the industry. And when we were designing this presentation originally, one of the challenges that we had, and as the Minister has, has, has talked through as well, so much has actually happened in the last two years with regard to the volatility that has occurred, with regard to the red lines that have been drawn, rubbed out, redrawn, spoken to again, that it's actually bordering on impossible to go through that roller coaster in what was meant to be just a 20 minute presentation. But what we looked to do actually was just to do a roadmap of the last three weeks and just talk through some of the big announcements or thoughts, and some of them summarise, I guess, what's been happening over the previous two years as well. But if you see in The Guardian on the 12th of June, commentary that says the UK economy shows the greatest sign of stress since 2012, all of the recent forecasts are telling us that when the UK is leaving, it will be leaving as the poorest growing economy in Europe. And you're seeing that economy that is being battered, I guess, by a number of forces, but uncertainty being the most important one. And it's had a fight, I guess, on inflation over the last year, with price inflation and food inflation specifically growing for the fastest rate in 2017 as it did in the previous three years. And if you look forward to that economy, you're seeing that consumer prices are forecast to rise by 2.7% and perhaps rise by this just 2% then in 2019. You've got consumer confidence in the UK that continues to be low. And again, when you're trying to analyse why is it so low, when you particularly have a strong jobs market, you've got rising real incomes in the UK, and you've got low interest, but that consumer confidence is pulling back that you're going to have, or, or you're having, almost self-imposed <laughs> austerity coming from the UK. And is that, I guess, the question to be asked? Is that the hallmark of pre-Brexit Britain and how long will it continue to afterwards? The next piece, I guess, and that's realize, a, a huge realisation from all of our perspectives of this world is not standing still. And you see just yesterday where you had the management of Asda and Sainsbury's brought before the British Parliaments and being questioned significantly or interrogated, I guess, on the justification of the consumer interest in their £12 billion merger. And commitments have been made by Mike Coop to say that this will result in a consumer interest of less than cuts of 10% right across the board for their prices. However, they were challenged yesterday on fudging the information and fudging their insights on what exactly this would happen. And clearly there's a concern that goes back to the supply chain on where exactly are those price improvements going to come back to. And from an Irish perspective, clearly that is a question that's out there. Although the commitment that's being made, it's only the very big companies that will be affected. But those very big companies source from smaller companies on a very, very often as well. So the ripple effect of that could be profound. But we're being told, and just last week we were told, that this is going to take 15 months. So it's business as usual for the next 15 months. So it's quarter three, quarter four before anything is going to happen and business will be operating to that extent. Whilst the Minister has been talking about the fact that we have so much in common with the UK and we are each other's biggest partners and we share so many of the issues that are going to come on Brexit, the order or the priority of our issues is actually quite different. And it was again just in the last two weeks that the UK and its food industry went and said the number one issue that it is facing as a result of Brexit is labour. Full stop. And I guess this came out just last Tuesday when the British fruit growers uh, were talking to say they're harvesting now. This year's is a problem. So it's not a post-Brexit scenario from their perspective. It's now. And you had uh, Secretary of State uh, Michael Gove suggested that robots will solve it all. Um, National Farmers Union, and obviously you'll get a lot of sensible talk when you're talking to our farming stakeholder, said that's an unimpressive solution but that is not going to happen when you now have a problem. You also have um, another interesting solution that came in the last three weeks was from S Justice Secretary David Goke. He suggested that prisoners and school children should be used to address the issue of labour. Again, not a particular pr practical result that people are looking for, but it just shows you that people are grabbing at straws, I guess, to try and to look at the labour issue. 
And Ireland isn't immune from this labour issue either. We have unemployment at 6%. The minister at the High Lick yesterday was looking at labour from a perspective of all of our growing industries. We will be competing with labour. You could say we do still have the option of looking to the wider European labour force, but labour will be our issue as well going forward. But unlike the UK, it's not our number one issue. These two faces, I guess, are becoming the, the backdrop of our lives for so many of the, the last uh, parts of the two, last two years. But I guess for the last two weeks, it's been quite bewildering, the conversations that are going on. And I guess this battle of wits that's going on as well from the perspective of what's the role of the British Parliament in Brexit negotiations? What compromises are actually being made in those discussions? And actually, is anyone thinking of the discussion that's going on with Europe as this internal fight is getting more and more intense? And from that perspective, we're seeing an increasing split with most recently Boris Johnson claiming that the Department of, or the Treasury within the UK, when it produced some dire economic forecasts, was at the heart of the Remain campaign and that they were being influenced by Project Fear. And that he called on his own Prime Minister at that point to take on a little bit more of a Trump stant, stance in her negotiation style because that really was what was needed for the Brexit negotiations to have any positive outcome. And if you do adopt that particular style, um, it does go for a rather interesting output when you look at the, the drama, I guess, that ensued from the G7 meeting with Trump's withdrawal from signing up to anything from that, his suggestion that Russia should be included in the G8, his then drive towards protectionism as the only way forward for an international trading economy. And again, you're looking at how does this affect all of our businesses, particularly on our exports to the US, but again, is there opportunities as this tariffs continues for their traditional uh, commercial partners and looking for Mexico. But again, these are all too early to draw. And all of that then is in the backdrop of other discussions that are going on. So the billionaire George Soros has pledged funding to Best for Britain, which is literally looking to have a campaign on a new referendum on what's going to happen on the terms of Brexit. So you've got lots of different stakeholders that are pulling lots of different stunts, I guess. And all of this is hypnotic in its compelling nature from the perspective of what's going to happen next. Hour by hour, there's some new episode in this drama that we're all facing. And as I said, that's just the last three weeks. So when you're looking at what you can control and what you can't control, it's all the more important, we believe, to have data at the heart of everything you do. And none of us need an introduction to what's happening in the UK market. We know our exposure to the market. We know that that exposure has been declining, but our exports have been increasing. We increased an extra 7% to the UK market last year, although our dependency went down uh, two points. We're also, if I look at quarter one of this year, we're up 4%, and that's being driven by a very healthy performance in, in meat and dairy. So when we're looking at our dependency, that is not declining in any way to the UK. And if I look at quarter one from the sectoral perspective, again, that dramatic story of uh, stories within stories, I guess, from the different <coughs> sectors and what's happening for those sectors, our dependence on horticulture remains very, very high at over 95%. Our dependence in meat at over 50%. And the options that arise for us to move that meat anywhere else, when they're going to the best paying market, they're going to our closest neighbours, they're going to a market that has huge um, insight and appreciation of that product. But again, just for quarter one, you can see that those figures remain very, very stable. And I guess that was why, when we were looking at the Brexit barometer, it's been around a theme of measuring our progress. Because when we looked at this back in 2017, our key driver behind this was to have some data, to put some line in the sand, because at this stage, this time last year, there was a huge flurry of activity, but there were very few data sets and data points for that. And the key insights that we got at that particular point were to talk to us about the key challenges, currency was at the heart of everything that was being discussed last year. But then also route to market and supply chain were relatively new conversations that we knew we needed to have. A completely new vocabulary was being brought in on trade tariffs and customs and non-tariff barriers. And this is what really was at the heart of all of our discussions. But this year, when we looked at 2018 and designing the Brexit parameter, what we really wanted to do was sense check the conversations that we'd been having in the course of the year 
there had been some dialogue and rhetoric that Ireland wasn't really preparing. We were talking but not preparing. And what we really wanted to do again was go back to the data sets, get real data that would tell us the facts and figures on what was really being prepared and monitor the progress on where we needed to do more and see where there are gaps in our knowledge in any way in that space. So what we did, and we partnered with Aon, and Keir Jackson's in the room here today, which we have to do a significant call out for all of the work uh, and tireless hours that she put in to getting this data analyzed for us. But what we did was we did an online survey with 117 companies over 35 days. We had, uh, Shane and I were laughing about how can you have 99 plus questions, but basically we had between 99 and 120 questions, depending on an answer the companies gave, we drove deeper into that. And we were effectively looking to get deeper in our analysis here with six core topics that we wanted to understand. And those core topics were around customer relationships because that's really where, I guess, the tire hits the road. We were looking at the supply chain because the complexity behind that is really becoming visible at this point. Customs and tariff to understand the progress that had been made. Financial resilience to understand how companies were preparing for that and market diversification. But we also took the opportunity to start looking at emerging risks and to understand were there other things on companies' minds for future scoping and future proofing what our businesses would look like. So the company profile of who we spoke to was right across the industry again. And I guess what I will be calling, and we had representatives from every section of the industry, but what I will be calling out quite continuously during the course of this presentation is the breakdown of the company sizes through this. Because rather than traditionally and last year, we had a very, very strong message coming through on sectoral differences and how sectors were preparing. That's less relevant this year. And much more so is the company's exposure and their size as a result of that. So we would have had uh, about 26% of companies who are under 1 million euro. Now granted their exposure to the UK will be less as well, but those smaller businesses are going to have, um, are going to be vulnerable by, I guess, literally by the resources that they have available to them. So you've got a split, roughly speaking, 56% are under 10 million, 40, um, no, 54% are under 10 million, 46% are over 10 million. So you've got that 50-50 split on uh, around that area, but you will have differences coming through the, the, um, the results on that. So if I can go through to the findings for you at this stage, and I guess the big good news story from our perspective is that 74% of companies have actually, will, will talk to us about the fact that they have made progress, clear progress or some progress for Brexit. And when we're talking about progress, we're defining that as making plans and taking action. So when you're looking again at who is making this progress, however, you can see that that pink bar is taking actions, the blue bar is uh, making decisions, and then the yellow bar, which is I guess too high for those companies under 1 million euro is a significant challenge that companies are facing. And I guess even more importantly, this is still in a backdrop of 60% of our companies being very uncertain as to what is going on. So you've got about 25% of our companies who are pessimistic about what's going on, and I think with justifiable reason for that, but 60% of companies are still preparing and making decisions even though they're uncertain as to what the outcome of those decisions will be. The customer relationship, which is one of the key platforms that we wanted to talk about today, and again, we were really interested in understanding what was happening, particularly with our British customers. And again, 85% of our uh, clients have met with their UK customers in the last 12 months, which is absolutely core when we're looking at building and maintaining the ambition to write new business with them. And when you're looking at have you spoken to them about Brexit, almost 80% of companies have had conversations with their customers about Brexit and had majority of those companies are having two to three conversations about Brexit. However, there is a cohort, roughly speaking 20%, who are not having conversations about Brexit. And when we looked and asked what was happening in that space, 42% were saying the buyer indicated absolutely no interest in going there. And I guess what our message on that would be, we want our industry to be confident enough to have those conversations. It's clearly a sensitive topic from the perspective of many retailers have instructed their buyers not to speak to this topic. But as we get closer and closer to decision time, having the confidence of sharing your level of preparation and showing your agility on how you're looking to work with this is becoming more and more important as we go forward. 
We're also looking at developing of marketing strategies. And I guess last year, and I'll, I'll put the last year's figure as the lead on this one, where 39% of companies actually had a marketing strategy for the UK. And although they were very confident, over 80% were very confident of writing new business in the UK, only 39% of them had a plan on how to do it. That figure has evolved significantly with now 54% of companies having a plan. And when you take out the companies with a turnover less than 1 million, that figure goes up to 63%. So significant progress being made there on meeting companies, meeting customers, talking to them about Brexit and having an expectation of what we're trying to achieve in the market. Similarly, when you're looking at uh, your, your the specifics of that, of what are you doing and how do you expect to write business in the market, you're seeing that companies have invested and they have presence over in the UK market with 57% of companies having a resource over there for their sales and asking then how are you expecting to write new business in that market, you're seeing companies focusing on new product development, enhanced key account management skills and enhanced marketing skills. And that again is, I, I guess, an indication of the sophistication of the relationship that Ireland has with the UK that they have very, very understandably built up relationships with each of those key customers as well. When you're looking then at your supply chain, um, and again, this, I guess, would have almost two sides to the story here. Some of it is very, very positive, and some that we have uh, clearly more work to do as well. But I guess the good news, and starting with the good news, is that 62% of companies have mapped their supply chain. And that's a core, critical first step for where we're wanting to get this business going. Because without understanding the supply chain, we're actually going to be in severe difficulty. And last year, again, when we asked companies, were they, um, what, what was their supply chain? Was it prepared for Brexit? There was a significant number of companies, 68%, who just didn't know what their supply chain was doing. And again, that number has significantly decreased, thankfully, down to 40% of people who don't know what their supply chain is doing, down to 33% when you remove the companies with the 1 million turnover from that as well. When we're looking at though the caution that we would bring to it, because although our companies have told us that they are very dependent uh, on the supply chain, many of the questions that they're asking is perhaps not going down to the deep level that they'll need to, and particularly as we consider that hard Brexit risk, how much information and how much preparation should we do? So when we're asking companies about their stock taking levels and where were they putting stock and had they done scenarios for that, had you look at other locations, only 36% of companies had actually looked at that. And again, you see a strong divide between the larger companies and the smaller companies from having taken that extra step as well. Another piece that needs, I guess, further work is when we're looking at companies having strategic relationships in their supply chain. And what we meant by that strategic relationships, and it was defined in the, in the questionnaire, was very much around the fact that if that supplier wasn't there, could you still supply your customer? And so 62% of companies have a critical relationship in their supply chain. But when we asked those companies that had that critical relationship, had they checked the resilience of their supplier, of that key supplier to them, 58% or 59% had not done that. So again, it's bringing it to the next level on that area of preparation for that. Again, asking the right questions and understanding the detail behind the supply chain, we were asking our companies, are your supply chain registered with AEO status? And more so than the answer, it was more the don't know, I guess, that we're calling out, where 68% of companies actually didn't know were their supply chain registered for AEO status or not. And it's not to say they have to be or they don't. Companies have to make a judgment as to whether that's relevant for them. But the don't know, I guess, was the area we'd again in interrogate to say how much of our supply chain mapping it is one thing, but really understanding the detail behind it is the next core piece to it. Moving on to customs and tariffs then, and again, this is a very, very core area for us, but what we're looking within that customs and tariffs and understanding about our customs and tariff is helping companies understand themselves what's happening. So when we're looking at, are you comfortable that you know the tariff classifications that are associated with your product, only half of our companies know that, 52% of our companies. And again, that's smaller for the, or that's lower for the smaller companies. And yet again, how confident are you feeling in managing customs? It's just 28%. Now, all of this is understandable, I guess, but this is 
crying out for training, for more information. And that's really been one of the, why, from a Borbia perspective, we've been investing in training in this space. And again, why Carl will be talking to us later to understand what is happening in our supply chain and what is happening on those risks that we're clearly going to be facing as well. Have you looked at and modelled the costs of, of customs processes, including compliance? Again, a significant uh, and reasonable jump from this from last year. Higher again for companies who are a little larger, with 29% of companies have modelled the cost of customs. A higher number of companies have modelled it from the perspective of what will it do to my sales price in the UK? and limited their calculations to that. Logical, but I guess as we move up the agenda even further, more work will probably need to be done in understanding the nuances and the dynamic of that, where we're at just 32% are modeling those costs into their business. When we looked at uh, the fact that over 60% of our companies are exporting to non-EU countries, we again asked the companies what was happening with regard to AEO status and understanding were they registered for AEO status and were they preparing to register and only 23% of companies were preparing for AEO status. And for those companies who are not, and you can only register for AEO status or trusted trader status if you are exporting to non-EU countries. So for companies who are not exporting to non-EU countries, we asked, are you thinking about it? Are you preparing for it? Because it takes anything up to nine months to get this over the line and very detailed and rigorous paperwork. So we're asking companies, have you started thinking about this and have you looked at the dynamic behind it? And again, quite a small number at 26% at of companies looking at that. However, looking at the, the more positive again, when we asked companies about the implications of VAT, and were they looking at the calculations of VAT from a Brexit scenario? Again, very small numbers were looking at this last year, with just 20% of companies having any awareness. And it was quite below the radar of many companies when we spoke to it last year. And again, a significant jump to over 50%, bringing that over to 60% again when you talk to the larger companies. Moving on then to the, the financial resilience, I guess, and linking that cash flow conversation, we also asked companies about currency and where they felt uh, and how were they uh, managing the risk of currency and had they identified the risk of currency as it went to Brexit. And 77% of companies had said, yes, we have done that. And that figure goes up to 89% when, again, you take out the under 1 million companies as well. And this graph we shared with you last year, which was how dramatic would it be for you with regard to Brexit are sterling rates for your business. So at what level of that sterling rate would your business have severe difficulties? And you can see the majority of companies at that 90 mark were in severe difficulty. If I roll on now to where companies are, are speaking to it, that has effectively moved up one, one point, I guess, or one block, which is at 5p, um, for companies getting more and more um, aware and I guess more able to compete at different levels. So there's probably two big messages coming through from that. It was 80% of companies last year that had a difficulty if it was at 90 to 95. That number has gone down to 55%. Still challenging, but that's the rate that it's at at the moment. And if I go up to the other side, to the beyond parity discussion, only 1.5% of companies felt that that was in any way not going to be putting them into severe difficulty. That number has gone up to 23% calling that out. And that, I guess, is a signal of A, price recovery from the market. It's a signal to say, well, we have been at 88 for quite a while, so there's a realism coming into that. Um, there's a leanness and there's a reformulation and a cost competitiveness, all part of that, which again gives us the opportunity to talk to, talk to that topic, I guess, during our panel discussions later as well. When we're looking at hedging and on the topic of currency, um, the food industry would have traditionally had a mixed relationship with hedging as being seen as a panacea for anything. And again, that relationship continues to be mixed with just under half of companies having a hedging strategy for, the UK, for, for, their, uh, for their currency exposure. And that's more extreme for the smaller businesses again, with the larger businesses being much more comfortable in that space. And again, it's the, the perspective of what is the risk to companies? Can they manage that risk? 
risk. And in, in fairness, putting into context the perspectives of the smaller businesses, many of them do price in euro when they're at that small stage, so perhaps hedging isn't relevant for them immediately. But it is something to be conscious of, particularly as we face into potential volatility from the market. And looking then at the final slide on the, re on the financial resilience, we were also asking companies about the investment plans and had those investment plans been impacted by Brexit. And 50% of companies said they hadn't. Now, this graph doesn't add up to 100 because you're going to have multiple answers given by companies. And it's almost a tale of two halves where 50% of companies said they, it hadn't, but effectively 50% or 48% of companies said it had. Because if you look at the figures for investment put on hold, capital expenditure projects delayed, operational projects delayed, so you're basically getting a mixed response from companies with uh, two different messages coming through there. A very interesting piece, and perhaps optimistic, but you don't want to be naive on it either. Only 3% of companies were, tra were considering that transferring production abroad was being viewed as a viable option, or they were being viewed as filling it in in a board via questionnaire as a viable option is something that we might obviously be conscious of as well. If I move on then to market diversification, which I guess is the, the final key point for that, we're looking at a fairly positive story here. And again, what we were asking companies is, are you actively seeking to expand your business um, in non-EU markets into new markets, or sorry, into non-UK markets? Well, we've had 85% of companies said yes. For the larger companies, that goes up to 100%. We're asking companies, have you had sales growth in non-UK markets? 75% in the last 12 months have said yes, they have. We've asked them, where do they feel that they're going to have the biggest opportunities and what markets have they been looking at? And again, Europe is by far the number one market where they see that first initial growth opportunity, followed by US, Canada, Middle East, China, depending again, and there's probably is closer to a sectoral story coming in on this, which very much maps and mirrors the market prioritization studies that we've been working with and that was funded by the department earlier this year, but is very much looking in partnership with industry at translating that into the supports that we have as well. We've also asked companies specifically, as you're having that ambition, and 80% of companies have the ambition to grow their business internationally, what we're then asking them are, do you have a marketing strategy? And again, this is becoming more an area of focus for companies, with moving from 56 to 61% of companies, yes, we have, and then again, up to 63% of companies for the, larger, for the larger ones. We're asking them what actions are you taking? So you're optimistic to write new business, you have a strategy in place to write that business, what are the actions that you're taking to convert that? And you can see here it's led by attending trade fairs, which I guess again is an illustration of perhaps the lack of close relationships with key accounts in those markets, the earlier stage that we're at in trying to convert that business. And from a Borbier perspective, when we reflect on the huge uptake that we've had over the last 18 months in the, sh in the trade shows that we've been participating in, you can again see this as a key driver for them. But they're also looking at market research, they're looking at leveraging networks, they're looking at consultancy, et cetera. So when we're wrapping uh, our arms, I guess, around the, the key messages that are coming through here, you can see that financial resilience is core. It has evolved and it's a new story that's coming through there. You can see that big uh, developments have happened in the area of customer relationships, in the area of market diversification, but probably more and more intense work will need to be done in the area of customs and tariffs and in the area of really getting into the nitty gritty of the supply chain. We were asking companies about future proofing and what are the other risks that are on their minds that perhaps they're behind the Brexit from a perspective of uh, blind panic, but they're actually on the agenda for where we go next. And the kind of conversations that are emerging there are the impact of UK inflation coming into the Irish market. What will happen to that? You're also looking at um, that whole, and again, the minister mentioned it as well, is changes in regulation and the divergence and any risk of divergence in regulation is coming up as a very big emerging risk. And increased consolidation slash, com slash competition, I guess all of uh, that will be mentioned again in the Kantar presentation later, where you're looking at our customer base becoming increasingly consolidated, resulting in fewer customers that companies have to operate with as well. So when you're looking at the so what behind all of this, one of the core 
actions now from a Borbia perspective is how do we respond to these results? And clearly from today's event is sharing the results because core to everybody being on the same page on the areas that we need to focus in. Those summary results and the recommendations on what to do next are shared with you today. And all of the 117 companies who filled in the questionnaire will be getting a benchmarking study from us as well. Because what we're really looking to do is make sure this becomes a toolkit for industry. And what we're looking for that toolkit is a, creating uh, user-friendly toolkits from the perspective of templates, how-to, how do we make sure that we know what's available to us from different resources, but also then boosting some of the, res some of the training that we're doing in customs, currency risk training, supply chain workshops, and Shane Hamill, my colleague, will be designing that and launching uh, and undertaking those projects in September when companies are back uh, in full scale as well with us. But those Brexit parameter outputs will be shared with companies from their perspective of benchmarking companies against how they voted versus companies of a similar size to them and what their answers were. So again, companies can get a moment to reflect on the detail behind that as well. I'm also delighted, though, to take the opportunity to share with what, you what Board BIA is actually doing about this, because we've spent the last 12 months doing an awful lot of work internally to, uh, to react to the work that we've, the insight that we've been gathering and to the conversations that we ha we've been having with companies. And from that perspective, today we're launching a brand new set of services called Plan to Grow, and my colleague Ailish Ford and her colleagues uh, are driving this through. So Plan to Grow is a new way that Borbia is structuring itself to have conversations with industry, and it's a new way that Borbia is going to have different styles of conversations with you. Because fundamentally, the message coming through from the barometer is the importance of having clarity on what we're doing, clarity on the strategy and how that's developed. And I guess we want to simplify this rather than doing uh, days and days and days of conversations <laughs> We've effectively uh, put this back to two key questions that every company needs to know the answer to, is where to play and how to win. And when we have clarity individually and collectively on those two key answers, then that as an industry is a very, very strong statement for us. And how we're looking to have those conversations is actually pulling all of the strength of Borbia together, be that insight, market and sector, to act as one to support industry to answer those core questions. And more importantly than answering just those two questions is then when we have the answers of how to, where to play and how to win, is what are you going to do about it? How do you execute that and how do you know you're doing it right? And that's the support package that Borbia will be rolling out to industry. Because fundamentally, we believe that there's a game-changing opportunity to happen here. That this idea where we're playing with gut feeling rather than making decisions based on data, where we're doing things the way we always did it rather than we're actually going to new places to make, meet new markets, to meet new customers, where we're moving from a position of being lucky to get business to actually structuring to build business. And that's the food industry we believe that we have ahead of us and the supports that we'll be giving to that. So we're going to be rolling out a multi-platform program behind Plan to Grow. That will be, first of all, an online learning and webinars so that all of, all of industry, no matter what their size, have access to this. Because whilst the larger companies have made more progress, there's huge work to be done by all of the industry still. And what we're looking here is through plantogrow.ie, this platform that we're creating, is sharing that knowledge, sharing that process, working and boosting that through workshops, seminars, masterclasses on the key topics that we need to do that on, and also working on a one-to-one -one basis to have bespoke supports ready for companies. And clearly, when those bespoke projects are ready, we'll also be boosting that with areas that companies need further help on, which, as I mentioned earlier, with the customs training, currency risk, and supply chain workshops as well. Key to all of this from a Borbia perspective is future-proofing. It's future-proofing our supports to you as an industry. You may know that at the moment we're going through the biggest recruitment drive that we've ever had as an organisation with 30 people uh, now at second interview, I hope, joining us very, very shortly post that. And that recruitment is to support the activities that we're looking to put, to put on here. We've also adjusted our talent programme, and you may or, or may not be aware of our MSc in supply chain, where because supply chain is the most complex area that we believe our industry is facing, we've put in a new programme where we have supply chain ambassadors now sitting with Tesco, 
Marks and Spencers, Sainsbury's and Sodexo in the UK to understand how they're dealing with the supply chain issue and to help inform, guide and educate us on the questions and conversations that are happening in that. Clearly our market prioritisation will be driven on to the next stage and the implications of that are very clear in your ambitions to diversify as well. And all of this information feeds into the new strategy that Borbia will be launching for January of next year as we look into our next three year cycle. So I hope uh, that's bringing some clarity. I feel somewhat um, out of poor form that the Minister is able to quote Roy Keane and I've gone to Spain for my quotes um, with these different big Spanish writers. But I guess the message is the absolute same. Um, we're preparing and to be prepared we know is half of the victory. But fundamentally its action is going to be the foundation of the success that we need to have. And that action is going to be by all of the actions that all of us are taking over the next weeks, months and years because none of us know when the end is in sight here, but all we can do is prepare and control what we can control. So hopefully there's been some clarity in that presentation for you. Um, we'll be breaking for a coffee break at this stage, and if there's any questions, all of our team are available and familiar with the results of the Brexit barometer that we'd be delighted to bring into you in more detail. Thank you very much.